Well, welcome to the Cut for Time podcast here at the Canton United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Clay. I'm joined by Eric Stearns, and today we're digging into my sermon from Sunday, which was the continuation of our Moses series uh, called Grumbling in the Wilderness, uh, talking about the times that God's people had a hard time uh, trusting in God's provisions and went to Moses in a very grumbly fashion, and how Moses grumbled to God, and then how God provided time and time and time and time and time again. So we're going to be digging into more of how that story worked. And because the interaction on Sunday was not the only time that this happened in the history of the Hebrew people. So we're going to be digging into some of the grumbling stories uh, from the Old Testament. So let's get into it. So Numbers and Deuteronomy and all of those other, the books around that time talk about how, how things are to be built in order to worship God, like the altar and the tents and the breastplates of the priests and all that kind of stuff. We have, um, <laughs> These churches that just look like warehouses. Mm. Is that what God is asking us to do? I don't know. What are your thoughts? The churches that look like warehouses mainly come out of like the Rick Warren seeker sensitivity movement of the of the mid 90s of just, you know, we want the church to be a place that is comfortable. We want the church to be a place where people belong. Um, you know, there there is this element where a big old, you know, a big old building can be, you know, intimidating to some people and off-putting to some people. And, you know, are we willing to risk the gospel not being proclaimed to people that badly need to hear it because they don't quite know how to navigate our, our, our you know, quote unquote, fancy buildings? A dear friend of mine in seminary went to a storefront church. Like, I do understand that mentality. I do understand that mindset. Um, but there is just a sense. And I'm, I mean, I am a, I'm a high church. I'm a church nerd. You all know who I am. I appreciate the, the connection between the aesthetic of how things look and, and that connection to the divine. I appreciate liturgical art. I appreciate, you know, liturgical colors. Um, you know, we're doing confirmation on Sunday and I already changed the banners because the appropriate liturgical color for the day is red. Um, you know, and I'm that kind of nerd, um, you know, and I come by that honestly. Um, but I do think that there, that there is a, there is a, there is a point where we do go too far in the other direction of just, you know, yes, God is present everywhere. And yes, we can worship God wherever we find ourselves. Um, if it's in a warehouse church, if it's in a high church, if it's in, you know, the middle of a cornfield, we can worship God in all of those places. There are certainly places where we, you know, limit the gifts of those that have artistic gifts, um, you know, just because we're going to try and make someone more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm a very practical person. And mm -hmm. so art and stuff doesn't, doesn't do anything for me, but there is, sure. there is something about the church that I just think should stand out from everything else. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just blend into the background. You should be able to, in my opinion, you should be able to look at a church and be like, that's a church. That's a place that's special. Right. It's a place that's different. Yep. You know, and yeah, that's my approach to it anyway. Yeah. Well, like even, you know, like even like priestly vestments, like I wear, I mean, I wear a robe on traditional Sundays, um, you know, and I know that there are certain of my colleagues that don't make that same choice. And I kind of wear it more out of habit. I mean, part of the reason why that I, why I wear it is out of habit because I was raised at Brickings first in ministry and we robed every Sunday from Labor Day to Memorial Day. And then not during the summer, cause we're going to die of heat stroke during the middle of worship. Um, you know, so I am, I was raised in ministry to robe and I do because I appreciate the aesthetic of worship and how that connects us to God. And then also just that, you know, especially the stole is a symbol of our service to Christ. Um, it is a reminder that we've taken a yoke upon ourselves that we are as much as we want to be just the normal people. And like, I don't get jazzed up when people call me clay and not pastor clay. I just don't, I don't have that bone, um, to pick with people. But yet I want people to know that I have made these vows and take them seriously and will live within what those vows mean for me as an ordained person. Um, and then and that, which means that I'm never not the pastor um, of the church that I'm serving. And so I, and that, and that I, and, and that I mean that seriously. 
Even for you, you are no matter what, no matter no matter how much alike you are to the people that are in the congregation, you are different. Mm -hmm. You are set apart. It is. It's just kind of the way it is. Yeah. Yep. You are asked to play a different role than the rest of us are. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. So I don't know if it's off putting or not, but I, I still wear a robe and stole or, you know, we have a traditional service on Sunday for our confirmation service. And I already told them this is what I'm wearing. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to be wearing my robe and stole on Sunday. So sounds good to me. Yep. And yeah, there there is a large chunk of numbers in Deuteronomy where that is what God is laying out. Um, you know, because that's how seriously God takes holiness and that's how seriously God wants the people to take holiness. And, and that's how important worship is um, and how important worship should be. There's there's a lot of numbers in Deuteronomy that you can't cover. I mean, there's just a lot there. Yes, there is. And when you read it, you probably fell asleep a couple of times. Um, yep. <laughs> yep. But Yeah. And it's it's really hard to understand, mm -hmm. at least in my opinion. It can be for sure. Yeah. So this Sunday, we talked mm -hmm. about manna and fish and quail and all sorts and cucumbers and watermelon and everything else. <laughs> yes, all the the sheer provisions of God that God was willing to give to the to the Israelites as they were making their way from Egypt to the Holy Land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And once again, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. but to give up all of your freedom for cucumbers and watermelon and leeks and everything <laughs> else that they were getting in Egypt, I just don't get it. Yeah, no, but I it don't. was because they didn't know what the future held held mm -hmm. and all they knew was what was behind them. Yes. And they're also dealing with 400 years of history where this is all that they knew and it's all mm -hmm. that their parents knew. And given, you know, how generations work, it's all that their great grandparents knew is that they were in Egypt, that they didn't have to worry about where their next meal was coming from because Egypt wanted them to be, you know, content and complacent as they took more and more of their freedoms away. It's kind of like that, how you boil a frog, you put it in, you know, you you put it in the water and before long, it's, you know, it doesn't notice it's getting boiled. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's the same way with the Israelites. Like we don't quite know how it shifted from Joseph being the one that's in charge and this right hand to, to, to the Pharaoh that 400 years of history, we don't know how, we don't know how that shifted. We just know that it shifted. You know, like I talked about at the very start of the sermon series, all were all that we are told in Exodus chapter one, verse four, is that a new Pharaoh had arisen that had no idea who Joseph was because it had been 400 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's, and then that shift had already been quite well established that they were enslaved and were not free to leave. You know, and so that was all that they knew until Moses came to Pharaoh and said, hey, this is crap and it's going to be over really, really soon, whether you like it or not, Pharaoh. So get on board, you know, and, and mm -hmm. the people, all they saw was their security being taken from them for the sake of freedom. And that's scary, you know, like not mm -hmm. knowing food insecurity is a is a, is a very scary thing. Not knowing where your next meal is coming from, not knowing exactly what you're going to be doing the next day, not knowing if you're going to be safe the next day. That's all that they could see was Moses was telling them or was Mo Moses was forcing them to completely re envision how their lives worked. And they responded, I think how we would all respond by not being very happy about it. Yeah. Well, even think about it. It's one man and his brother. Mm -hmm. Yep. Leading 600,000 men into the wilderness and wandering. Like, how does that work? How does he even get them to do anything? Right. I mean, that's a town for, I mean, if you take into women and children, that's four to five times the size of Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. in people yeah. saying, hey, let's go walk this way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even understand how that's possible. Right. But Moses is the guy with the, with the, with the, uh, with the stick that turns into a snake. Um, and mm -hmm. Moses is the guy that is telling them that God said these things because God said these things. And right. that, you know, that, that does, 
that does mean something to them. You know, they are able to, you know, even though they don't quite know what it means to follow God, they still at least have some knowledge that God was the God of their ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because that's how God prompts Moses to respond when they say, who's this guy? Why should we listen to him? Oh, he was sent by God. Okay. Maybe we need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so, but yeah, it, it, it does break the brain a little bit to think of the, of the logistics of how, you know, how this had to have worked. Yeah. Yeah. And then not actually know where they're headed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're headed to a land that Mm -hmm. they don't know, really know where it is. Right. I mean, mean, they interpreting that correctly. They might know where it is. I mean, they, they, there is some history there because this is where Joseph and the brothers and, and even Jacob came from. And so they would have had some rumblings of their history. Um, you know, once again, it's 400 years ago. Yeah. You know, so do they really, I mean, they maybe, yeah, maybe they have a rumbling, maybe they have uh, some old stories that maybe Mm -hmm. even a general area, but you got to wonder like, did they really know where they were headed? Yeah. I mean, like you said, we know a multitude of things more than Moses did. mm -hmm. And he just did it. And he led, you think about that and led how many millions of people just because that's what God told him to do. Yep. Yeah. It makes it even more amazing. After a while, the, you know, the provisions of God were not enough. I mean, they, they, the people wanted more and more and, you know, God provided, you know, they wanted, they wanted Moses to, you know, leave them alone. And, you know, if you let really let us out of the will, if you, if you really let us out here in the wilderness to die, then, you know, we might as well just do it and get it over with rather than string us mm-hmm. along like this. And, you know, that's when God, that's when Moses goes to God the first time and God says, you know, okay, here's the bread, um, you know, and like I talked about on Sunday, it eventually becomes not enough. And so God said, here's the quail. Um, and you know, you would think that that would end Israel's desire to grumble. Uh, you would think that that would, would have been enough proof to say, okay, as long as we're, you know, got, we've got bread, we've got meat, you know, maybe, maybe this Moses guy does know what he's talking about. Maybe this God really is in control. Maybe this God really is going to provide for, for, for my future. And so I can just take it down the worry a little bit. But that is not exactly how it goes for our dear friend Moses. Um, you know, right. the people get um, uppity, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, they they continue to challenge Moses. They continue to press against what, what Moses is up to. Uh, they continue to grumble and rebuke him. And, you know, yeah. And it is in one of those, like, you know, I was talking a little bit before, um, a little bit off mic, that um, this is the reason why Moses is not the one to lead the people into the promised land. In Exodus 17, so they're frustrated with Moses again. Moses is frustrated with them again. Moses goes to God and says, you know, what do I do? And God says, use your rod, strike it against the rock, and water will pour out. And that's what happens. That should be the end of it. That should be the end of them wanting. That should be the end of them getting grumbly. That should be the start of them saying, okay, God is going to provide for our needs because God has done this already thus far, Um, but it doesn't. And so later in the book of Numbers in chapter seven, in chapter 20 of Numbers, um, there is an incident where Moses, where the people are challenging Moses one more time. They're in a place called Meribah um, and Massa. goes to God and says, what do I do? And Mo- and this time God says, speak to the rock, don't strike the rock, and the water will gush out, and it'll be okay, I'll provide for the people again, we've got this. And in his frustration, Moses does not listen to God. In his frustration, Moses goes back to what worked beforehand, the, the first instruction that God gave him, disregarding this new instruction. So he doesn't just speak to the rock, he hits the rock twice. And he talks to the Israelites about how he is the one doing all these things. I'm the one providing. And that's not necessarily the case, because if it weren't for the power of God working through Moses, they'd still be stuck in Egypt. Um, They would not be experiencing this level of freedom that they're about to, that they've been enjoying this entire time, but they're about to enjoy a whole lot more when they get to the promised land. 
And so it is God's punishment for Moses taking matters into his own hand, Moses taking credit for the work that God was doing, that God pulls pulls both Moses and Aaron aside and says, because you both could not hold your temper, you are not going to be the ones to enter the promised land. I mean, that had to have been such a hard thing to hear. And then you keep in mind of the story that Aaron dies even before, you know, very shortly after this part of the story. This is the this is kind of the end of Aaron. And Moses is at least given a glimpse of the whole holy land by God, um, you know, but it is Moses and Aaron's son that are given this glimpse. And then, you know, Moses has to pass on leadership to Joshua. Um, before he eventually does make his his exit from the story in, in death. So, yeah, I mean, this is uh, it's such a pivotal part of the story because it explains what happens at the end of the story. Um, and like I talked about a little bit off mic, there's just so much to Moses's life that we're just not going to get to. In a five week sermon series. Right. Hmm. Seems to be a common theme, though, right? Oh, yeah. Where just any of the, at some point, the the character that we are studying screws up something. Mm-hmm. Doesn't yeah. do what God asked them to do. And, and the results are as, uh, you know, whatever they might be. But. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Adam and Eve, you know, God said, don't eat from the fr- eat of the fruit from this one tree. Well, they do, and then there's a consequence, you know. Yeah, that's the origin. It's the origin of sin in our lives, mm-hmm. of us. And it's not just Moses and Aaron. It's not just other characters in the Bible. It's us too. That right. you know, God has given us a clear command to what to do and what not to do. And yes, there's some gray. There's some gray area, and there's some room for wiggle room and interpretation. But you know, there are things that are non-negotiable for us as people of faith. It's interesting. I mean, that's the reason why we do these types of sermon series is for us to look at the, you know, quote unquote heroes of the Bible. And a lot of them are very heroic and you know, I don't want to, you know, take anything away from them. But I also want us to see them as human people that struggle just as much as we do. Um, and so if God can use them, then surely God can use us and does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that seems that's the underlying theme of all of these that we've done. Mm hmm. You know. Why not us? Why can't we be used in some way? Which kind of sets us up for next fall because we're going to be looking at the unsung heroes of the Bible of just, you know, people that played a pivotal part that we just don't talk much about. Um, Sure. So So you just let the cat out of the bag. You're going to be here at least another two years. Is that weird? Well, we'll see what happens. (laughs) I serve at the pleasure of the bishop. So uh-huh. as long as it's Bishop and Lynette's uh, pleasure to to leave me here, I will serve faithfully the Canton United Methodist Church. So. What else did you want to talk about? The heart of this whole story is just God providing, um, you know, and, and and us putting Israel putting their trust in God's provision, us putting our trust in God's provision. Um, and so I would just be curious to know if there's a time that you can point to in your own life of faith when you were in need and you really experienced and trusted the provision of God. I think about uh, when we were seniors in college at our, at semester break, we had single digits in our checking account, Mm. freshly married, you know, six months into marriage and just waiting for uh, student loans to kick in for the second semester. But that's probably not really. (laughs) I mean, Although we were broke and I was like, boy, I don't know what's going to happen. Although we knew it was going to happen. We knew that the, you know, the funds for the next semester were coming. Right. Um, we just had to be patient. Mm-hmm. Which is hard in itself. And, mm-hmm. you know, thank goodness I had a wife been... there with me. Like it's... going through being broke by myself would not have been easy. Mm-hmm. And I could rely on her to, you know, just be there to support. And, you know, sure. you kind of feel even though you're fresh and college students and whatever else, even, you know, I still felt like I should be the provider and I couldn't mm-hmm. at that point. Yeah. Stuff like that is hard. Yeah. Uh, especially in the moment when you're just starting out on your own, 
your um you really have no clue how the world works when you get married at 21 um and just hoping that everything's going to work out fine you know and 12 years later i think it has uh, sure. I, think, I think things have gone pretty well so maybe that maybe in our marriage in a sense is that you know when we got married we just got married because we thought well we loved each other and why not yeah you know yeah. very naively and not really understanding what the impact of that hmm. decision is um but god has provided all 12 years sure you know and it's Absolutely. been the best decisions we we've, we've ever made best decision we've ever made Mm -hmm. um i wouldn't change it right and it's yeah it's been awesome thanks for sharing that eric i mean truly like i mean and that is i mean the just the blessing of companionship um and just you know knowing that you're not alone no matter what in life yeah that is that is a huge it's a huge provision for sure yeah yeah up for you yeah i mean um I've just been thinking that I've had the honor, the unfortunate honor of singing in a lot of really hard funerals. One of the things I can always trust and know is that God was going to give me enough to get through the music of what I had to do before I was a com complete and total mess at a couple of the different funerals. Um, when I was a senior in high school, one of my mom's best friends passed away um, named Diane. It was um, just kind of a horrible thing because Diane had been through this. This was her second round of cancer. She had gone through cancer and been in remission and the cancer came back and it was it was a hard one. I mean, it was right during football season. It was just, you know, there was just a lot of layers to why this was going to be a hard service to have to sing at because this the, because Diane had meant so much to our family. Um, you know, this just getting through that funeral, you know, was was really, really tough. Um, you know, and like when in earlier when I was in high school, um, a, a classmate of ours lost her little brother in a car accident. Um, and we were asked to sing by Melanie, um, by, by, by this kid, this kid's mom. And you just can't say no to her. There's just, just a general rule of life. You just don't say no to Melanie. Um, and so we, we sang and just getting through the raw emotion of dealing with, you know, all of the, just, just, just with cord dying, you know, that was hard enough. And then you have to sing at the funeral. And I remember like the moment that like the inside of me just broke and it was after we had gotten done singing and I knew that I had no further responsibilities and I could just finally melt into the puddle of tears that I needed to. But God had given me enough strength, enough whatever to get through at least to that point um, before I could just completely break down and be a mess. Now being a pastor, there have been times where I've been called on to do hard funerals um, and that has been that same feeling of God providing enough strength, enough focus, enough, enough barrier within me to be what people need in that moment with disregarding what I need in that moment because I know my moment's coming after. Well, it seems like you're in the right profession because that, that, uh, that gift from God is probably necessary more than you know, just when you have to sing. Definitely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So next week's sermon, sermon end of the series. Yes. Is end of the like? series. We're going to be looking at um, Deuteronomy um, is a, is a book of the Bible where kind of Moses wraps everything up and the book ends with the death of Moses. Um, and even the name of the book, Deuter means second. Um, so it is the second giving of a lot of these things. There's not a whole lot of new territory that we cover in Deuteronomy. This is Moses's final instructions to the people of God going forward. It's Moses imbuing leadership upon Joshua, and it's the death of Moses. That is the book. If I wanted to sum up the book of Deuteronomy in a very few short sentences, that's that is it. Um, you know, and so we're going to be talking about the parts that Moses really emphasizes passing on the teachings of the faith to the next generation, um, because we have a very interesting um, Sunday plan because it's going to be a recognition of 50 year members, um, including your dad. 
Um, and then also a celebration of confirmation where we are in the welcoming the next generation of 50 year members um, to the life of our church uh, by confirming them as full members of the church. Uh, they are going to be taking their baptismal vows upon themselves. They have come to a point in their faith where someone has successfully passed on the teachings of Christ, um, you know, parents, guardians, Chi Alpha teachers, myself. Um, you know, we've the, everyone that's that's played a part. The church has done its job of uh, living into it, its call to you know to help people live Christian lives to the point where they make this decision for themselves. Um, so this is the expression of the church's responsibility to pass on. Um, and then we also are celebrating communion, uh, which is also a passing on of uh, of God's promises through Jesus. And so this is going to be you know I. I, I I was telling uh, your wife earlier because she's playing piano on Sunday that this is going to be a five minute or a five sentence sermon um, because there's so <laughs> many other moving parts to the service on Sunday. Um, but uh, I do think that this is all going to push to this is how Moses ended by making sure that this that this went on. Um, that this wasn't mm -hmm. just Moses and his wild adventure in the wilderness. This was the beginning of the people of God. And how did that get passed on? to then get passed on, to then get passed on, to now it's the story of the Canton United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so that's going to be the going to be the, te the the tenor and the direction of where we go on Sunday. That's good. Yeah. Well, if you want to be more wordy, we've got a podcast next week. So uh, very next. true. Yes. And there might also just be a podcast version of the sermon too. We'll see how sure. it goes. So. Gotcha. Yep. Nope, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us in this week's Cup for Time podcast. Join us again next week in person at church at 10 a.m. for a lot of exciting things. Or back here for the podcast next week. Thanks for listening to our Cut for Time conversation. Join us for worship in person or on Facebook Live Sundays at 10 o'clock Central Time. And now go in peace and serve the Lord.